What is constrained motion you ask? I think it's best to start with an example, okay? So this is gonna be the simplest kind of constrained motion that we will deal with. Imagine you have a pulley, and that's a massless pulley. Okay, so let me write that down somewhere. That's a massless pulley. And you have a massless string that goes over it, like so. And attached to it are two blocks. Let's call this block as M1 and let's call this block as M2. For simplicity we can assume that uh, M2 is greater than M1 so that we can get some intuition behind it. But that's not the necessary condition. Okay now my question is if I release this system what's going to happen? Well it's quite intuitive to understand M2 is going to accelerate down and M1 is going to accelerate up. But I want to calculate the acceleration so I want to know what the acceleration of each block is so I want to know what's the acceleration of the first block what's the acceleration of the second block and I also want to know what's the tension in the string so there are three variables which I have okay let's begin <clears throat> now in this example I know m2 is going to accelerate down and m1 is going to accelerate up right but in general that may not be the case. In general, it could be very difficult to predict the acceleration. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to predict, I'm going to, I'm going to treat this like a general case. I'm going to say, look, I don't really know what direction the acceleration is. My brain can't handle that much information just like that. So what to do? Well, we can just assume. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume this mass is going to get an acceleration downwards. And I'm going to call that acceleration as A1. And I'm going to assume that this mass is also going to get an acceleration downwards and let me call that as A2. Of course, I know this is ridiculous now because one of them have to go up. But I'm telling you what would happen in general. I would show you that even if you make such ridiculous assumptions, you will eventually end up with the right answer. That's what I want to show you. That's the goal. Let's write down the forces. We have uh, M2G acting downwards here. We have M1G acting downwards here. And there must be tension force acting. And remember, it's the same string. The so tension force must be the same in both the strings. All right, now to solve this, we need three equations because there are three unknowns. But we can, we can make an equation for M1 and we can make an equation for M2. Where do I get the third equation from? Let's worry about that a little bit. Let's just make equations. So for M1, one I'm not gonna write the formula anymore the equation is going to be I'm gonna take downwards positive so it's gonna be m1 G minus T equal to m1 a1 that's equation number one for m2 follow me closely by now you should have practice of uh, get, writing these equations directly I'm gonna again take downwards positive so I'm gonna talk m2 G minus tension should be equal to m2 a2 that's equation number two so we have two equations like what we discussed where does the third equation come from the third equation comes from the fact that this is a constrained motion the third equation is the constrained equation a constraint is basically an additional condition which is there to the system besides the usual f equals ma the additional condition is the string is inextensible okay usually they should mention that in the problem but even if they don't mention we're gonna pretty much assume that the string is inextensible because of that it implies something very important we can derive it but I'm pretty sure you don't need to derive that one thing you have to understand is since the length of the string has to remain a constant if this guy goes down by some factor by some length this fellow must go up by some length by the same length which means if, if this guy has a velocity downwards of say 5 meters per second at any moment in time this fellow must get the same velocity 5 meters per second but in the opposite direction so it has to get opposite velocity 
This guy has an acceleration downwards. This fellow must get the same acceleration upwards. That's the constraint equation. You can prove that and uh, you want me to prove it? Okay, I'll, no, I will not prove it. Do you want me to? Okay, I'll prove it. So I'll tell you how we can prove it. I'm gonna take this part of the length. So I'm gonna prove it once and for the, for the uh, rest of the constraint equations, I'm not gonna prove them. All right, anyways, take this part of the length. Let's call that length as X. And let's consider this part of the length, this part of the string as Y. So X is this length of the string and Y is that length of the string. So we know that X plus Y is a constant regardless of what happens because it directly comes from the constraint equation in extensible because x plus y is a constant if i differentiate this x dash plus y dash this, this dot represents differentiation okay must be zero or x dot must be equal to minus y dot x dot is the rate of change of position which is velocity of x you see velocity of this string must be in the opposite direction of the velocity of this string Velocity of the string and the velocity of the mass are the same thing. So this is pretty much saying that velocity of m1 must be in the opposite direction of the velocity of m2. And I can double differentiate this. I can differentiate this again. Now, now I'll get x double dot equal to minus y double dot, which immediately implies that acceleration of the first block must be equal to minus of the acceleration of the second block. And that's our equation number three. That's the constraint equation that we were looking for. So what we can now do is we can substitute this over here. So I'm going to substitute a2 as minus a1 and I'm going to solve this now. I think I will need another paper to solve this or no, I don't. I'm just going to move this up a little bit. Okay, so we have this guy and this equation I'm going to substitute. So I'm going to write the first equation again. m1g minus t equals m1a1. I'm going to substitute this equation over here. So that's going to be m2g minus t equal to m2 and a2 is minus a1. Oh, I should have substituted that over here. I'm going to substitute uh, a2 as minus a1. That's also fine, right? So minus m2 a1. And I'm going to try and get rid of t. So I'm going to subtract. So I'm going to call this as positive, negative, positive. This cancels out. And I'll end up with now m1 minus m2 times g must be equal to a1 times m1 minus m2. Therefore, a1 is m1 minus m2 divided by, oh this is plus, m1 plus m2 times g. And there's our acceleration. There's our acceleration A1. Okay? Notice that when I deep when I build these equations, I took downwards as positive. Remember, look at these equations. You can pretty much see I took downwards as positive. In both cases, I took downwards positive. So notice that the acceleration A1 will be positive if M1 is greater than M2, which makes perfect sense. If M1 was greater than M2, M1 would go down and M2 would go up. So acceleration A1 would be a positive number. On the other hand, if m2 is greater than m1, that is m1 is smaller than m2, then acceleration will be negative. This is a negative number and that also makes sense because if m2 is greater than m1, which is the case over here, then m1 will accelerate up. See what I told you? That's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. It doesn't matter what you assume, your final answer are going to be perfect. This is the most awesome. This is awesome, okay? Because you don't have to worry too much about the initial conditions, you can just assume whatever you want. And now we can substitute this guy over here and I leave that to you. It's simple algebra. You do that and you will see that tension is going to be equal to 2m1 m2 times g divided by m1 plus m2. I really hope you can get that by yourself. Partly the reason why I'm not doing this is because I don't want to use another paper. I'm gonna finish it off in this one. It's, it's, it's direct. It's as direct as possible. Also, I'm pretty sure you can understand what a2 is. A2 is just the negative of this one, okay? So we have now solved our first constraint equation which contains pulleys and masses.